I have a confession to make. I like footnotes. I really do. The longer, the denser, the better they are. It's not meant to be funny. It's true. But it might sound odd for some of you to hear that. But I'm a historical theologian and read historical texts, and I like to retrieve these documents from the past. And when you work with sources, you have to be able to read and interpret them wisely and well. And perhaps you have discovered this yourself, that some of the books that are being written these days are based only on secondary sources. So as you read something, it's already at least one step or more removed from the original documents from people who've actually studied and wrestled with those statements. And for fear of that, we don't know if it's actually authentic or helpful at all for us. So one of the first things I do when I open a book is I check out the footnotes. Read through them, see what they say, see if there's anything of value, and whether I should read the book or purchase it or not. With that idea, you might appreciate my delight. When I began reading and meditating on this passage and discovered in verse 31 a footnote, there it is. But these are written that you may believe, footnote, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. The way the verb believe is rendered here is that you may believe or you may come to believe. But the footnote says, or may continue to believe. One is the aorist, one is the present may come to believe, evangelism, people coming to hear this for the first time. Absolutely essential that as people read and hear this authority from John, that they would believe that Jesus is the resurrected Lord. But what about us, people who have already heard and embraced the good news? The footnote also speaks for us. Not only may we believe or come to believe, but may we continue to grow in that belief. No longer the idea of evangelism, but now of sanctification, of continuing to deepen our heart and mind and soul in this awareness of Jesus Christ. And since the sources indicate that both are reliable and some commentaries, commentaries actually say that the second is preferred, it might well have been the Holy Spirit's intention that both of these are important for us. To hear the words to come to belief through evangelism, through conversion, but to continue to grow in that ongoing awareness through Christ as our Lord who sanctifies us. With that as a backdrop, notice that John gives us three very specific appearances of Jesus following Easter. The first happens on Easter Day. Jesus comes to the upper room where the disciples are gathered. We don't know whether it's just the ten minus Thomas or others who are there, but it says that they were there with the doors locked for fear of the chief priests, of the Jewish leaders. Little wonder. Just a few days ago, Jesus, their master, their teacher, was crucified. What might that mean for them? And so they're there gathered in fear behind locked doors, and Jesus stands before them. You can imagine their shock and surprise. Perhaps as a way of trying to help them understand that it was he, he says, look at my hands, look at my wounds, visible evidence that I am the Messiah, that I am the one to whom you have believed and followed. And then the text says that their fear was transformed into great joy. The anxiety, the shock, turned into great celebration. Sadly, Thomas was not there on this occasion. You perhaps can imagine how they would then tell him, we have seen the Lord, he is alive, he is risen. But Thomas unfortunately has gotten the name of Doubting Thomas over the centuries, said, unless I see, unless I put my fingers in his wounds, I cannot believe for myself. Now, Jesus actually says in our passage, stop doubting and believe, Thomas. 
And if you read earlier in the Gospel of John, Thomas is presented as someone who's very impulsive, someone who immediately wants to stop what he's doing and follow Jesus even into dangerous situations. Or very concrete, very literal, very hard and fast in his understanding of things. And Thomas Truger, a contemporary hymn writer, has captured perhaps very powerfully this idea or these images around Thomas. He says, these things did Thomas hold for real, the warmth of blood, the chill of steel, the grain of wood, the heft of stone, the last frail twitch of blood and bone. His brittle certainties denied that one could live when one had died until his fingers could read like braille the markings of the spear and nail. May we, O God, by grace believe and in believing still receive the Christ whose raw palms out and beckoned Thomas from his doubt. But in fairness, let us realize that Thomas expected nothing less than what the disciples had already witnessed. Jesus showed them his wounds. We also know in Luke's gospel that Jesus actually invites those individuals to hold his body. And in their doubt, he says, give me a fish so I can eat it and demonstrate that I am alive, the risen Christ. Jesus graciously accommodates Thomas' doubt. And as he stands before them again on this occasion, he says, put your fingers into my wounds. Put your finger into my side. The text suggests that he did not have to do that. Maybe the hearing of the voice that was so familiar to him. Maybe the visual sight was enough. And all he can say is, my Lord and my God. Some have noted that Thomas doubted more than anyone in the Gospels, but also that his confession was higher and deeper than anyone else in the Gospels. So while for the first disciples that first Sunday, their fear turns to joy, for Thomas's doubt turns to this confession of faith. As we look at verse 29, Jesus really summarizes this experience. He says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That was true for all those early disciples. They saw the physical evidence. They saw Jesus physically in their midst. And indeed, they were blessed. They were blessed. But Jesus says, even more will be those who have not seen and yet believe. That by their believing, they will actually see me. That's where we come in. What do we need to believe? Certainly to believe that Jesus is the risen Christ. Notice how this is a confirmation of the actual words that Jesus spoke in the upper room. He told them that he would die and be raised to new life. To believe the promises, the words of Scripture that declare to us who Jesus is. What do we see as we believe? We see the Christ, don't we? We see him all around us, the evidence, the witness, the glory of God in our very midst. Some of you are familiar with Ignatius of Loyola. 16th century Spanish leader of the Roman Catholic Church, well known for his spiritual exercises as a way to help his members to continue to grow as disciples of Jesus. An important part of his writing is what he calls the examination of consciousness, a way of trying to become aware of Christ present in everyday life. I have a good friend who summarizes it by asking two questions. Where have we met Jesus today? Where have we missed Jesus? Where have we met the Christ? 
Where have we missed him? In one of my undergrad classes, we begin every Tuesday evening with that question. Where have you noticed God since we last met? I challenged them at the beginning of the semester, and I asked them throughout this, because I know from my own experience and in talking and working with others, that as we ask that question, we become more sensitive to the reality that Christ is indeed in our very midst. But what if we don't see the Christ? What if we haven't had any fresh experiences of Jesus in our own life? It's certainly not automatic, is it? We need to engage in spiritual practices so that we can be more sensitive and aware, to read and meditate scripture, to engage of acts of mercy and justice, to cultivate silence, to participate in public worship. Those are all relatively easy. But we also have to examine our fears. The fears that so often can keep us from seeing Christ and recognizing His presence in our midst. This past weekend, we had the great joy of being back home in Grand Rapids for the celebration in our old church, and also to see all of our grandchildren. Pierce is our youngest. He's two years old. And he and his older sister like to play this game where they are a big lion, and they roar at Grandpa. And every time they roar, I go, oh, and I run and I hide. Pierce got this silly blue bunny mask in his Easter basket, and he put this thing on, and he puts it on, then he turns to me and goes, roar, and I run and I hide. And he comes after me and he says, don't be afraid, Grandpa. It's me, Pierce. And every time I came back, he'd wait for a couple of minutes, and he'd go, roar. And I would run back again and hide. And he would always come to me and say, don't be afraid, Grandpa. It's me, Pierce. That's what Jesus does, doesn't he? Don't be afraid, Priscilla. It's me, Jesus. Don't be afraid, Dan. It's me, Jesus. Don't be afraid, Heath. It's me, Jesus. Don't be afraid, Rich. It's me, Jesus. He reminds us over and over again, regardless of our fears, whether it's finances, having the money to pay our bills, whether we'll graduate, finishing our comps, our creative ministry projects, thesis, dissertations, whether we'll find a job, all sorts of fears that fill our hearts and mind. But we also have to be brave and have the courage to look at our doubts. The doubts that we might sometimes have, especially as we go through difficult and challenging times. God has seemed absent to us. The experiences of joy and vitality that we had at one time seem to be so very, very foreign in past. And whatever those doubts are, Again, those need to be recognized and exposed and offered to God. Last week, I had an undergrad student came, came to visit me, and we were talking about some things, and in the process, he says, you like symbols, don't you? I said, yes. I usually have something in my pocket as a visual reminder of the faith, some biblical image, something that's important for me to remember. He said, well, let me show you something. And he reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a five-inch piece of wood. It was a branch that he had carved down. And while the, the cross pieces were very stumpy, it still looked like a cross. And across the base of it, the long length of it, he wrote the word veritas, truth. And I asked him, what does this mean, and how do you use it? He says, whenever I stick my hand in my pocket, whether it's consciously because I need the reminder or just randomly as I'm going through the day, I feel the cross and I'm reminded of the promises of God. 
the promises that Jesus never fails, that Jesus never forgets you, that Jesus never ignores you, that Jesus is always with you. And there are so many powerful reminders in the scripture. In Genesis with Abraham, God himself will provide and supply you with the lamb. Or in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Or in 1 Thessalonians 5.24, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Therefore, as we stand here today in the afterglow of Easter, listening to these words of John, let us also examine our fears and be brave to look at our doubts. And as we listen, may the eyes of our heart be opened so that we indeed can have, through the power of the Holy Spirit, those fears transform into joy and our doubts transform into confession that Jesus is the risen Lord, that Jesus is my Lord. For what John has written was to help people to believe and to help other people to continue to believe that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.